goal of Innovate Ohio from the very beginning was to make Ohio the most innovative, entrepreneurial, creative state in the Midwest and to use technology to improve the way we serve our customers, the people of the state of Ohio. But with that is a responsibility to protect their data so it is not misused. And the purpose uh, of our being here, or gathering here today, is to announce the introduction of the Ohio Personal Privacy Act by Representatives Carfagna and Hall. Uh, I very much appreciate uh, their leadership and willing to, to lead on this. Somebody who has established himself as a leader in, in uh, technology uh, and innovation in the legislature and somebody who's going to be our leader into the future uh, on these issues. So. Uh, we appreciate their their support and work. Uh, also, Carrie Couric uh, is with me. Carrie has uh, worked on regulatory matters uh, both at JCAR and the Secretary of State's office and then uh, at CSI and uh, does a great job in navigating these issues uh, now at Innovate Ohio. And Kirk Harreth, uh, Kirk has um, been a great private sector contributor to what Ohio has done over the past, gosh, at least five years. Um, and uh, he's on the Innovate Ohio board. He chairs Cyber Ohio and recently retired as uh, nationwide vice president and associate general counsel and most importantly, chief privacy officer. So he knows these issues well. And um, we, uh, he helped us bring together a great group of privacy experts from the private sector and beyond to help put this today. So why does it put this together today? Why does all this matter? Uh, important question I always ask, uh, and it's because a person's individual data is more exposed now more than, uh, more than ever. Um, we continue to research uh, as consumers uh, online, use online services, we purchase pr items online through computers, phones, tablets on a daily basis. Our digital exposure is only growing. This information is collected by our mobile operators, internet providers, device manufacturers, apps, and they use it for their own purposes or to sell it on occasion to other businesses. Each time the data is exchanged, it's potentially exposed. The data and personal information uh, that data and personal information, if misused, mishandled, or inadequately protected, can potentially result in identity theft, uh, financial fraud, and other problems, which in turn puts the burden on consumers to sort out and, in many instances, pay for with both their time and treasure. Uh, so today, we're going to talk about how Ohio can better protect its citizens and give them more control over their digital presence. At the same time, this bill helps us to proactively work with the business community on their data privacy plans to better protect consumer data and, pr and improve their overall interactions with business. The business world knows that privacy protection must occur, and they've been a cooperative part partner in helping us put this bill together. So what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Uh, right now, the data privacy, data privacy for Ohioans is very limited and protections, frankly, do, do not exist. Many businesses already have privacy standards in place, but these policies are not necessarily uniform or do they go far enough in scope. Many of you might be aware that, that other states have begun to address these issues. California uh, recently uh, passed a bill but frankly, our assessment was it was not very user friendly, particularly complex and burdensome, especially for small and mid-sized companies. Virginia recently enacted legislation that is a step in the right direction, but ultimately Congress has not acted in this space, so we as states must take the necessary steps to ensure that consumers are protected. And from the work that we have done, we believe and we aim to make Ohio's law a national model. Ohio set the bar in 2008 with the passage and enactment of Ohio, the Ohio Data Protection Act, which gives businesses who comply with outlined cybersecurity frameworks and affirmative def defense 
in cases of a data breach. We believe Ohio is once again taking the lead in personal protection, uh, in the lead with Ohio's Personal Privacy Act, which takes a sensible but firm approach to consumer data privacy. So on to the solution, which we're going to talk about. Representatives Carfagna and Hall have introduced House Bill 376, uh, legislation that will encourage Ohio businesses to adopt or develop a data privacy policy that meets a minimum set of standards while giving Ohioans protection over how their data is used. The bill would primarily apply to businesses with revenue over $25 million per year and apply to Ohioans 16 years of age and older. It includes a list of data rights for Ohioans that does not currently exist. So we're giving them data rights that they currently do not have. And uh, among these are your ability to have your personal data deleted and request that a business not sell your data. These rights would give Ohioans control over how businesses are using their data and give Ohioans options to tell businesses not to sell their data. Uh, I will let Representative Carfagna talk a little more about the nuts and bolts of the bill, but the bottom line is this. With this legislation, we will go from a state with zero privacy protections to a state with a sensible but firm model for helping businesses protect people's private data. I want to thank the Innovate Ohio Executive Board, uh, Executive Committee, and uh, the members of Cyber Ohio, which I mentioned is chaired by Kirk Harreth, for playing an instrumental role at bringing data experts and, the, from, and the, the private sector from around the country, in many cases global companies, to sit at the table with us and make sure that we get this right. Uh, and um, with that, let me uh, introduce Representative Carfagna, who will talk a little bit more about the uh, nuts and bolts uh, of this legislation. Representative? Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. It's Pleasure to work once again with you and with your team on the ongoing effort to modernize Ohio in our processes. Um, I really believe that these, the Personal Privacy Act is something that's going to position us as a technology leader on multiple fronts. Uh, House Bill 376 will balance reasonable privacy standards to protect Ohioans with less bureaucracy and regulation on businesses. And yes, we can accomplish both. Uh, there are elements and exemptions, uh, as the Lieutenant Governor mentioned, uh, California and Virginia. Uh, the, you know, there, there are things that we agree with in both those bills that we try to marry into this Personal Privacy Act. But you know, ultimately, we developed this with elements that are specific to Ohio, things that we think are important uh, aspects. And we envision the uh, Ohio Personal Privacy Act will very well serve, as he said, as a national model for data privacy, one that we hope states will look to emulate, but ultimately we would like to see our federal government adopt as our country's policy. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the scope of the Ohio Personal Privacy Act. It would apply to businesses in Ohio that satisfy one or more of the following. First, their, their gross revenue in Ohio exceeds $25 million. So that's the, the cutoff, the threshold. They control or they process personal data of 100,000 or more customers. They, de they derive over 50% of their gross revenue from the sale of personal data and process or control personal data of 50,000 or more consumers. So those are kind of the three buckets that if you, if you meet one of those, you're going to be subjected to this, uh, to this act. Uh, under this act, we are proposing, uh, as the Lieutenant Governor mentioned, uh, numerous rights to consumers concerning their personal data, including uh, first, the, the right to request access to and the disclosure of the data that's being collected on you. The right to correct inaccurate personal data that businesses may be uh, holding on you. The right to request that a business delete the personal data collected for commercial purposes. The right to opt out of the sale of that data to third parties. 
and the right to appeal to the Attorney General's office with any complaints. And then finally, I want to add that when, ex when consumers do exercise any of their rights under this Personal Privacy Act, we want them protected against business discrimination, and that's something that's very important to us, and we have those protections built into this legislation. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, all these complaints that will be filed, uh, we've done so with the Ohio Attorney General's Office. We're designating them as the exclusive authority to enforce the, uh, the act. No private right of action exists under this legislation. And frankly, you know, that's something that I think is going to set us apart from the other states. And what we want to do here is we want to be firm, but we want to be fair. We're here to be reasonable, and we want to ensure that uh, not only are Ohioans in control of their data, but we want to help businesses and affected organizations get on a pathway to compliance before any enforcement action has to be taken. That's why we're providing a 30-day period after a complaint is reported to the AG's office for the entity to cure any potential violations, to fix or implement a privacy policy, and make sure that it doesn't happen again. Uh, so when we turn to business obligations, uh, under House Bill 376, we are including a list of obligations for businesses to follow. For example, we want them to craft privacy notices about the personal data that is being collected and processed, and we want those to be reasonably uh, accessible. We want disclosures as to where data is being sold and some clear instructions on, as to how a consumer may, act, may exercise their opt-out rights. You're going to see some limitations as to both the types of data and the purposes of data as they relate to what can be collected and processed absent consumer consent. Uh, the Act uh, does contain a number of exemptions for businesses that are already compliant with uh, privacy frameworks that are already out there. Um, you know, Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, HIPAA, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the Driver's Privacy Protection Act, the Federal Family Education Rights and Privacy Act. Uh, you know, if you're already compliant with, with one of those frameworks, uh, you're exempt from this bill. You know, we want to make sure that this bill kind of comes in and, and kind of operates as a catch-all for those that have yet to maybe implement uh, some, some uh, excuse me, some uh, data privacy policies. Uh, you're going to hear a lot throughout this legislative process about NIST. And NIST stands for the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and they are the gold standard when it comes to cybersecurity benchmarks. They recently released a uh, data privacy framework for businesses and organizations to adopt. It's our preference to see businesses in Ohio create their own data privacy, data privacy programs that meet the NIST industry recommended standards. And what we want to do with this bill is take it a step further to encourage this by providing an affirmative defense against legal claims so long as the business is operating under the NIST framework and they are requiring all of the rights and the obligations that are outlined in this legislation. Again, let's be firm, but let's be fair. Uh, I now would like to turn to my joint sponsor, Representative Thomas Hall. Uh, Representative Hall hails from Butler County, a uh, freshman legislator who's shown great promise and uh, work ethic in his first six months, like me, a former township trustee. No stranger when it comes to governing and consensus building. Uh, this is actually our second bill that we're tackling together. I'm proud to call him my friend, somebody that I trust with delivering on important issues. So, Representative Paul. Good morning, and thank you all for uh, being with us today. Um, I'm thrilled to join Lieutenant Governor Husted, uh, Innovate Ohio, and my colleague, Representative Carfagna, and announcing legislation that will empower and protect Ohioans in regards to their personal information. Although the Ohio General Assembly is in summer recess, we have been hard at work with stakeholders and interested parties from across the state in discussing how we can properly balance reasonable privacy standards to protect Ohioans with less bureaucracy and regulation on businesses. Currently, there is no national standard, as alluded to before, for regulating the collection and use of personal information. The purpose of this bill is not only to establish a statewide standard for data privacy in Ohio, but also serve as framework for other states to adopt such a policy in order to promote a more comprehensive law across the nation. As the youngest member of the Ohio General Assembly, I know that those in my generation have a larger online presence and are more subject to knowingly or unknowingly sharing their personal information to third parties. I believe we should provide the tools necessary to empower and inform all Ohioans on understanding and controlling the collection of their data. 
By enacting the Ohio Personal uh, Privacy Act, our state can be a leader in protecting the personal information of consumers while removing confusion for businesses by providing clear guidelines on privacy standards. There are currently eight co-sponsors signed on to the Ohio Personal Privacy Act, also known as House Bill 376. Giving Ohioans more control over their digital presence is an issue I believe all lawmakers can get behind on. It is our hope our friends from across the aisle will get on board, and I look forward to having those thoughtful conversations with my colleagues as the bill goes through the committee process. With that, I will turn it over to Carrie Couric, Deputy Director of Innovate Ohio. Thank you, Representative Hall. The bill we're introducing today represents over a year's worth of focus by Innovate Ohio, the Cyber Ohio Advisory Board, and numerous interested parties. We began using the data privacy legislation in California and Virginia as a starting point, but our goal isn't to copy, we want to lead. We wanted to craft data privacy legislation that other states and the federal government can use as a model. So we engaged in six months of rigorous, interested party discussions that culminated in a large virtual meeting at the end of March that was attended by nearly 100 participants. Their ideas and feedback are reflected throughout House Bill 376. It represents a collaboration of many industries, technology, healthcare, finance, and business, among others. Innovate Ohio understands that many businesses already have privacy standards in place, but our goal with this bill is to create universal privacy standards that Ohio businesses can follow so they can better serve their customers. We want to ensure that Ohioans have necessary protections in place while still offering Ohio businesses flexibility and affordability to implement privacy standards. And we believe that House Bill 376 reflects this goal, so we're proud to introduce it today. With that, I'd like to introduce Kirk Harris, Chair of the Cyber Ohio Advisory Board. Good morning. My name is Kirk Harris. I have the honor and privilege of chairing the Cyber Ohio Advisory Board, which uh, originally started under the Attorney General's office uh, when Governor DeWine was Attorney General, and we were imported over, and we found a home in Innovate Ohio, and we have uh, been working closely with Lieutenant Governor and the Innovate Ohio Executive Board on a number of issues over the last couple years. I want to thank the Lieutenant Governor for his leadership and his guidance along the way. He tasked us, uh, it's been almost uh, two years ago, with starting to think about this. And as, as Carrie said, a, about a year ago, it, it started in earnest. Uh, we obviously got uh, sidetracked by COVID, as, as most people did. I want to thank Representatives Hall and Carfagna for their, for their leadership and for their support and for the collaboration with their, their staffs over the, uh, over the last six months. As Carrie said, we, we had a lot of input from a lot of sectors, um, public and private. I think we may have had the largest interested party meeting of, in the history of the state of Ohio. It's, it's great, you know, Zoom, you can get a lot of people on an electric call. The culmination of this really in the Ohio Personal Privacy Act is a win-win for both business and consumers. As was explained already, the consumers get a series of new rights that uh, in many cases are not available today. Business, on the other hand, also gets some clear standards. As was, as was already said, we, we looked at, we looked at uh, California, we looked at, at Virginia, we also looked at a lot of other proposals. I've, I've been doing this for over 20 years uh, as a privacy professional. And there's a, the spine through this is fairly, is very consistent with what I say, would say is, is a national norm. You know, access, correction, deletion, opt-outs. Um, that's very consistent. Where we think we are innovative uh, is the use of the, of the NIST P 
framework to provide a safe harbor for Ohio businesses. It provides flexibility and scalability, right? It's not a one-size-fits-all. California was very, very much one-size-fits-all, uh, very disruptive to small and medium businesses, a lot of very unnecessary expenses for very little benefit. There's no prior right of action, but there is strict enforcement by the Attorney General. The NIST privacy framework does provide a, a really solid uh, safe harbor from enforcement. Uh, again, it's, and as was explained by Representative Carfagna, there is a right to cure for inadvertent errors, right? There, there is, there's no perfection. Um, and so you will have 30 days to cure if, if there's a complaint. I can tell you, having, having run privacy programs, you can't build a privacy program in 30 years. So it's got to be an error. It's got to be small and it's got to be curable. And then it acknowledges existing strong standards that have been around for 20 or 30 years, right? HIPAA, graham leach Blyla, Bliley, FCRA, uh, FERPA for uh, uh, universities and public institutions. And then as has been stated by Lieutenant Governor and, and the others, we believe that the NIST framework standard, like with the Ohio Data Protection Act using NIST cybersecurity framework, will become a will become a national standard that other states will adopt. We believe that NIST is the national standard because it is, it's nonpartisan, it's universally supported by all industries and private sector groups, and it provides, again, the consistency and flexibility, and it evolves. It evolves without any legislative or regulatory action. It's almost like an open source model. So with that, I will pass it back over to the Lieutenant Governor for some final comments. Um, as Kirk mentioned, you know, Cyber Ohio was something uh, we couldn't do this without with our two attorney generals, Mike DeWine when he was attorney general, uh, and now Dave Yost, both uh, obviously very supportive of what we're trying to do today. Um, this is this isn't as I mentioned, uh, or as Kirk mentioned, we've been at this for two years. Um, this is one of the first things I brought to the Cyber Ohio team to say, what are we going to do about personal privacy? How are we going to help? protect people's data uh, and with the, the various things that we've seen in our society over the course of those two years I think it's I feel even more strongly about it now than then so appreciate everybody's hard work in this and we're happy to take uh, questions that you might have So, first of all, you have a new set of rights um, and a new set of standards, meaning that um, the companies that you're using their platforms have to protect your data according to a minimum set of standards that uh, will be prescribed in the law. And if you feel like your data is being misused, you now have the right to find out how it's being misused and to have it deleted. Um, those are the two things that jump out to me about it, but I, I will uh, defer to others who, Kirk or others who may want to add something to that. Well, there's a sort of, a, nas there is a, na a nascent opt-out, uh, do not track me right in, in the right to opt-out. So you have the right to opt-out of, of the sale of information. So if that company is using the, the information for their own purposes internally, um, then, then they're allowed to do that. But if they then broker that information off to a third party for some value, you know, money or some other uh, considerable value, then, then you have the right to opt out of that. You also have the right then uh, to, their privacy statement has to be very explicit. Their online statement is very explicit that they do sell information to third parties for the third parties for their own benefit. So. To, If they sell it, Facebook actually tends to be what's called a closed garden. So Facebook actually never actually sells their data because they understand it's valuable. <laughs> and what they do is they'll they'll just say, "I have 
you know, I, I know what Kirk Harris likes, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna serve up ads that Kirk Harris likes. Um, now, that's, you know, there are, so that is, again, you can often opt, you can often opt out of those ads uh, within the Facebook itself, right? There's, there's different ways of, there's no uniform way of doing it, but Facebook itself rarely sells data anymore. Um, they just, they just don't, because it's too valuable to them. Vendors, credit card people. Right, yeah. Give, give some examples of the kinds of things where the, the data is being sold. Well, yeah, so, so yeah, so consumer reporting agencies or in any, any company that, um, there are, there are less reputable, and I'm, I'm, I'm no real fan of a lot of the social media companies, but there, there are less reputable social media companies who do sell data. And in that case, if you opted out of that, you would have, a, you, and, and you continue to see, you know, things get served up to you, you have a right to then complain to the Attorney General, and the Attorney General can then start to investigate some of these, of these companies. But they have to be transparent in how they use the data. The privacy statement has to be transparent, and and then you have a right to, you know, access uh, the information that they have on you or, or correct it. And in some cases, even ask them to delete the information that they have on you. Would would add to that that there are some. This sets a minimum standard for privacy on how they have to handle your data. Right now, that may not be the case. In a lot of the companies that, are, that you're buying product from, they may not be using that minimum standard to protect your data. If you think about the number of times that you're interacting, um, every time that data is exchanged, you've, you've created one more exposure for yourself. And so having a national standard is, is in my belief, very important. But having a national standard that works for everybody smoothly is, is essential. We believe through the hard work that this group has done that, that we are, uh, we are going to be that national standard. Jim. Can you discuss for a second about how this might potentially affect governments? I'm thinking of the Euro motor vehicles, which uh, share a limited amount of driver information with other people who purchase that. Well, we, we, we have standards for the way BMV operates uh, that are compliant with these regulations. So it would, it would, uh, um, it would be, you know, that those would be covered. So if you're sharing information, if you're sharing information, Kirk and I talked about this just before we came here. If you're sharing information that is in a that is part of providing the service to the customer where you're not selling it or doing anything like that, that's a necessary element of the service. To opt out of that would mean that you couldn't, you couldn't have the service. So we're talking about when people sell your data, use your data for financial gain, not just how they use your data for the purposes of providing you a service. Could you talk about how this might uh, attract, could it attract businesses to Ohio, or could it lead to them leaving? And could you also, if the sponsors, talk about the timeline for this bill? Well, well, we actually pr passed, uh, the state of Ohio passed the Ohio Data Prote Protection Act in 2018, which, which is a very attractive element of bringing businesses to Ohio because it protects them so long as they meet these standards. We're now, uh, we're now trying to provide uh, a, a baseline of standards that we believe are, um, um, will continue to create that kind of predictable environment for how businesses and consumers are treated, which we believe ultimately is attractive for business. We, we consulted all types of businesses and institutions in the development of this legislation because they had found um, other states like California detrimental to that environment. And I think that when you see what Ohio is doing compared to what California is doing, it make Ohio much more a welcoming place.
through tracking like every single purchase I've swiped with my credit card, and if so, we need to delete that because I get like targeted ads based on like you know what I buy for my kids. So I assume they know every T-shirt and pair of shorts and swimsuit that I bought. I'm gonna I'm gonna let Kirk. Uh, <laughs> I, I'd go through that particular answer to that particular question, uh, and then what he doesn't answer, I'll try to. So individual companies, uh, they you know, loyalty loyalty cards and such. Those those would be permissible under this. Exactly. Um, you would have a right to ask for them to delete your data uh, if if you didn't want to get any of those rewards in the case of, uh, you know, but if, but if they sold that data to, if they're selling that data outside of their, outside of their company, then you have the right to opt out of that. So it, it really comes down to, to consumer choice at some point. You, you decide to do businesses with companies who you feel safe and secure doing business with. Their, their privacy statement will be transparent and will, will provide you with, uh, with information on on, on who they do business with and, and why, and then it's up to you to decide whether or not you know you feel comfortable with that. But in the case of a company, a specific company tracking your purchases and and then maybe providing you with coupons or or discounts, um, that is permissible under this. You could ask them to delete any of your data as long as it's not data that that is ongoing. So. So I, I worked at Nationwide for many years, right? So if I come and say, I, I want you to delete all my data, right? I, I can't be a customer anymore, right? It's basically I'm revoking consent. So you can ask them to delete anything and then they will, they will effectively tell you whether or not they can. So if a company just buys, to, to the gentleman's point back here, if the company buys certain data from the DMV, right? And you aren't a customer with them, you can ask for that data to be deleted in, in the company that, you know, it's called prospect data, right? Because it doesn't have any real bearing on, um, on your products or services. Um, but there's, there's sort of a, there's a, a series of exceptions to a deletion, like they may have it for a litigation hold, or they may have it because of, a, of, a, of a, some sort of law enforcement uh, investigation, or they may have it as a, re as a result of regulatory requirements. Uh, financial service companies have to keep data for in some cases, up to 20 years. Um, yeah, I guess it was like purchase history specifically. Can you just say, like, don't try this to my name anymore? Which obviously they have records of all the purchases. Sure. But it's like the profile itself that's created. You can ask them to delete your data. Okay. Yeah. And uh, then it, it's up to them to, to come back and, and effectively negotiate with you as to what that means. Um, if you mean everything and, and they then, you know, you effectively disappear and and if you were getting any any benefits from that relationship, that you know effectively disappears, right? My 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 get go gas perks, uh, I, I like those, right? Like. It's something where consumers are going to have to take some kind of initiative on their end, quite frankly, to, to, to contact the business, to, to request, what kind of personal data do you have on me? Uh, we are requiring them to, to put um, these avenues in, into some sort of an easily accessible format. Um, to, to, you know, to, if, if I want to know how to navigate your website to make these requests, they have to lay it out for me. But it's something that I have to actually take some initiative to do myself as a consumer. Um, but to circle back on a couple of the other questions, um, you know, I shop at the grocery store and they build a profile on me and I get, you know, customized coupons for things that, you know, I enjoy. But, you know, I, my daughter is 15 now. She's not five anymore. I don't need diaper coupons. So, you know, it might be, it might be worth trying to go in and, and clearing out your, your personal data from time to time. Or, you know, if I'm shopping at a major retailer and I'm a little bit wary about some of these security breaches that tend to, be, tend to happen from time to time. You know, I might want to exercise some caution and just say, look, on an annual basis, I just want you to clear out my data. Uh, we do have an opportunity for, for businesses to do what's called de-identify your data. So, you know, if they want to warehouse data from a given area, I live in southern Delaware County, I live in the 43082 zip code. So if they want to maybe say, okay, uh, Rick Arfania, we're going to de-identify you 
from all of this data, but we're still going to track that there are people from 43082 that enjoy purchasing these goods and services. You know, that's, that's something that, that's allowable as well because they don't know who you are at that point. Um, you know, what's, what sets us apart, I think, from the other states in terms of a business attraction piece, I think, are these legal protections. Uh, the fact that uh, there is no private right of action, I think, will be extremely appealing to, to businesses that are warehousing uh, large volumes of, of personal data. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're looking the other way as well. You know, we, we are establishing this firmly under the auspices of the Ohio Attorney General's Office. And they're going to be the ones that are warehousing the complaints, and they're the ones that are going to be seeking justice when there are breaches of, of that trust. Um, you know, we had talked, too, about if you are adopting those NIST um, privacy framework standards, that you're going to receive a, an affirmative defense against legal claims. I mean, all of those types of liability protections for businesses, for organizations that are trying to do the right thing, that are operating under these guidelines, that are safeguarding your personal data, uh, this is positive reinforcement of those things. And I think that's really important, and I think that's what's going to set us apart from some of these other states that have implemented um, this type of legislation. I just wanted to follow up on one of the previous questions. Uh, so the bill has been introduced. We have a bill number. The bill has not been referred to committee yet. Uh, so we, we do not know where the bill is going to end up in, a, in which committee, but we just do have the bill number uh, at this point presently. I would, I would just also add that we work with NFIB, the retailers, uh, the Ohio Chamber of Commerce, and others who uh, I think are sending out statements of support for this. Um, it, it is when you're doing something for the first time, I mean, we don't, have a, we don't have a regulatory framework for doing this. Most pieces of legislation are updating long-standing pieces of revised code that have existed. Uh, we don't have uh, long-standing pieces of revised code that regulate this area. So we, we are largely starting from scratch. That's why it's been a, almost a two-year process to get here. Uh, and we, I think we've taken it as far as we can go without um, committee hearings and vetting this out in, in, in the most public of ways that you can. And we look forward to continued input for, from, from people, but, but uh, Ohioans don't have these rights today. Businesses don't have these standards today uh, that they're required to meet. And we believe that that stability and predictability um, and transparency of the information, as you know. When more people know about what's out there, you get to have a conversation as consumers in a society where more and more people become aware of how their data is being used. And um, it, it's, it's really important that we move forward with this legislation for, for all of those reasons. Can you describe or maybe quantify the pool of businesses that might be affected by this? You mentioned it's 25 million. I think um, 25 million we mentioned. I think we have a, a data. I think what is it? A, a data standard of how many, how much data you have. Yeah. It was, uh, excuse me. <clears throat> 25 million in gross revenue for Ohio. Uh, if you control or process personal data of 100,000 or more consumers. Uh, so you could technically be a small operation, but you know if you're warehousing that, that large volume of data, you're going to be subjected to this, uh, unless you're already exempt because you're following another framework. Uh, and then the last bucket is they derive over 50% of their gross revenue from the sale of personal data and process or control personal data of 50,000 or more consumers. Uh, not off the top of my head. I know there have been discussions with the NFIB. You know, they, they obviously represent the, the smaller um, entrepreneurs. Uh, it'll be a very small fraction of their membership. We know that. Uh, uh, but, you know, again, a, a lot of the larger uh, retailers, uh, tech, tech companies, uh, we hope that we trust that they're already compliant with a number of these other frameworks that are out there. And if they're not, uh, or if you're kind of a medium-sized business and you're on the cusp of, of you know, crossing these thresholds, then we want to get you on that right pathway. We want you to adopt, hopefully, the NIST privacy framework or one of these other um, exemptions. And, and it's, it's also worth noting that, that, you know, these are apps, these are lots of things that, that, that literally, Andy, the business not even, not even exists today, and a year from now it, it, it has 
over 100,000 pieces of data because of the nature of how uh, technology applications can be used. And so it's, it's important to set that standard so that everybody knows what the deal is, what you got to follow, what your rights are. You've talked about retailers and tech companies. Can you just give a range of any other industries that might apply to? Uh, any, anybody that collects data on you. Utilities, telecommunications companies. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take a quick look here to see if I can give you the kind of, um, look, social media, uh, data companies, um, insurance, financial, um, you know, any consumer from a grocery store to a home supply store, um, you know. Yeah, banks, credit unions, uh, you know, anybody, anybody that's dealing with consumers. That's, you know, that's who, that's the people who keep the data. The, the, the small manufacturer is not the one that's keeping the data on you. It's people that are more consumer facing that are, that are keeping the data. All right. Thank you very much.